Uh, the world is so hungry for knowledge about what's going on right now in the world. They don't get it. They, they want to get it. And so they're doing some research now that they have never done in the past. And this is really important. Some of you may think this is like kind of weird, but you know, this is what they said. This is not what I said. It's not my opinion. This is what the technocracy movement said in 1938 in their magazine called The Technocrat. Technocracy is the science of social engineering, the scientific operation of the entire social mechanism to produce and distribute goods and services to the entire population. For the first time in human history, it will be done as a scientific, technical, and engineering problem. Now that's a loaded statement if I ever saw one. Uh, probably most of you would be a little nervous with the, the so-called science of social engineering. You didn't know that was a science. <laughs> well, they, they thought it was. And um, they had this idea, this came from Columbia University mostly of, of that day. And uh, they thought that, well, yeah, our scientific uh, methods and principles could be rolled over onto on uh, social engineering, engineering the society. Uh, it's just an engineering problem after all, they thought. So why not? Uh, you know, we can run things better than it's being run by the corrupt politicians that brought us the uh, Great Depression. There was lots of um, angst over the Great Depression at that time. Most people thought politicians were the blame for it, uh, sometimes the financiers. So these, uh, these engineers and scientists thought they were doing the world a great favor when they got together and said, we can do this. Science has the answer for society's problems and science is the only thing we need. Listen to us, they said. Follow the science, they said. We can do this together. Ah, well, we hear this today too, don't we? So this, the Technocrat magazine that I just quoted from goes on a little bit further. Uh, you might imagine these people had a big ego to think that they could do something that would produce something that would literally change and run the world. But they, they went on and they said, there will be no place for politics, politicians, finance, financiers, rackets or racketeers. Technocracy will distribute by means of a certificate of distribution available to every citizen from birth to death. They had this view that they were so perfect in their analysis, that science, their science was so certain that there would be no need for political system at all. No representation necessary by the people, no Congress, no uh, legal system per se, like we know it, uh, have known it historically in our country. But they had this, this giant inflated ego that they were so right that they could just say, gone, you don't need all that, politics out, scientific dictatorship in, case closed. We're facing a lot of these feelings today. If you're not feeling it right this second as I say this, you're missing something already, okay? So we're, we got a lot more to cover, but uh, this is where they were. Cradle to grave, maintenance of mankind. The reason they thought this way is that these particular scientists and, sci and engineers were greatly influenced by this concept of scientism. Scientism believes there's only one source of truth about the universe and the nature of man. They said it's science. If it can't be demonstrated and proven by their science, it doesn't exist. It's just gonna, we're just gonna ignore it. Ethics, nah. Morality, nope. Uh, the Bible, nope. Uh, how about, um, I don't know, any other, you know, f philosophical studies? No, they don't, they don't go for that either. If it can't be demonstrated in science, it's out the door. Not going to pay any attention to it at all. So this was their, this was their thing back in that day. And this was a, a dangerous, evil combination in that day, in my opinion. And uh, I want to point out that technocracy uh, it is an economic system. We've seen that in two, two of these quotes already. It is the only alternative economic system in the history of the world. You can't find any other economic system that's been developed from the ground up by anybody for that matter. This is it. So you might gather why I connected the early tri Trilateral Commission's literature, which talked incessantly about the new international economic order. Some of you might remember that from Jimmy Carter days. Then he goes on and they go on and say, we see how as a result of unsaid, the rich will get richer, the poor poorer, while more and more of the planet is destroyed in the process. Just process that for a minute. 
all of the promises of nirvana, of utopia, of green new deal and all that kind of stuff. We're going to save the world. We're going to save humanity too. We're going to save humanity. We're going to save the infrastructure of the world. That's a word that's being thrown around a lot today. We're going to save everything. Science is going to win out in the end, and you'll see science will save everything because we, the scientists, declare it. That's what Agenda 21 is all about, the agenda for the 21st century. They're going to do these things in the name of saving everybody, but the rich are going to get richer, the poor are going to get poorer, and while more and more of the plant is destroyed in the process. Only on Be Positive. Now, a little bit further on, they talked about the Biodiversity Convention. The Biodiversity Convention ran in parallel with Agenda 21, the, un the UNSET conference. It was meant to be a descriptor of all the things that would be sustainable in society. So it was kind of a detailed book. Very few people um, actually read the whole 1,200 pages. Uh, Debbie Bacigalupi did. I did too, finally. And um, it's crazy, it's a crazy book, but this was uh, very important to, uh, to the whole era in 2000, or excuse me, in 1992 um, with, the, with the Agenda 21, it went hand in hand. So they wrote about that in the book. That's why they wrote about the Biodiversity Convention in a separate chapter. So they noted, the convention implicitly equates, you gotta catch this, implicitly equates the diversity of life, animals and plants, to the diversity of genetic codes. By doing so, diversity becomes something modern science can manipulate. It promotes biotechnology as being essential for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Diversity becomes something modern science can manipulate. This is what they were talking about in the discussion groups that led to Agenda 21 and the Biodiversity Convention. There was more that meets the eye, even back in 1992. Now, this will kind of be interesting to you. He went on and said, uh, the main stake raised by the Biodiversity Convention is the issue of ownership and control over biological diversity. They've already cycled through animals now. They're cloning animals. They're genetically engineering animals. So the animal kingdom has been engineered, or at least the beginning stages of engineering. The last frontier for these people today is the human population of the planet. This was the takeover, folks. This was the beginning of the end of the takeover. They're pre preparing, if you will, for the takeover. And that's why I always say history is important. Words do matter. Definitions matter. And in this case, when you talk about biodiversity, I'll tell you, if you, anybody ever mentions the word biodiversity to you, stop them and ask them, what do you mean when you say biodiversity? Are you talking about the genetic ma manipulation of life itself? And therefore, you are controlling the diversity, that, in other words, the, the path of evolution, or what? Whether you like it or not, we are the resistance to this, and we and only we. And I'll tell you, if anybody expects that Washington, D.C. is going to save us from this, forget it. That ain't going to happen. They're, they're complicit with it. If anybody thinks Congress is going to save us from that, forget that. Con Congress has been off in a la-la land for a long time doing who knows what, but they're not going to save us from the, the, this thing that we're facing right now. And probably most state governments are not either. But the people on the street and communities around our country still have time and ability to make a difference in their own community, and collectively we can make a huge difference in our country. So I want to introduce you to Citizens for Free Speech. I'm sad to say that an organization like this even has to exist in America. Isn't it twisted that we would be fighting for free speech? Well, you know the sure signs of a revolution taking place, and I'm suggesting, yes, this is a revolution. We're engaged in a revolution right now being foisted on us. Every revolution in the last 250 years has always been preceded by a takeover of the media. Always. They go in and take over the newspapers, they take over the radio stations, then they take over the TV stations. 
and any anybody else that had a platform to speak, they would squash them. We see this going on in Hong Kong right now, by the way. Only on be positive. Revolution is preceded by taking over the means of communication so that the propaganda will be the only narrative that's, pr that's promoted and the resistance, the people who would want to know something else would be denied from knowing that, communicating with each other. Okay, our national media is gone, pretty much. They're not telling the truth, they're telling mostly lies. Social media and, you know, being totally censored. I just, we just got canned from Twitter a couple of days ago.